This is Comic Picks by the Glick. Hey, and I'm your host, Jason Glick. Hey, Jason Glick, how are you? I'm good, John. Yourself? Not too bad. What do you have on tap for us tonight, sir? <laughs> well, it's like we're in 2017 right now, and we can hopefully finally bid, bid goodbye to the garbage fire that was 2016. Hey, actually, I like 2016. A lot of good things happened to me in 2016. If everyone else had a bad year, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But I had one of the best years of my life, to be honest with you. So, But <laughs> I just want to throw that out. <laughs> well, that's that's good. I mean, like, yeah, there's lots of good comics, but there's also lots of reasons to, like, to hate the uh, to hate the year. It's like God, God forbid, I talked about that when I did my trans transmet podcast, and just like the sheer amount of people who, um, talented artists who died in the past in 2016. It's like there. That's that's one reason I'm just get calling like you know 2016 a garbage fire and getting away with it. But you know, it's like there were lots of good comics that came out. Like in the past year, it's like, and I'm here here to talk about like the ones that I like I like the most. So first, gonna, gonna, is, is this going to be a top ten list? No, it's, it's not. Gonna, gonna be. Well, you no, know, it is going to be a top. Well, actually, depending on how you want to look at this, this is probably going to be a top twelve list. Twelve. I mean, twelve because I I made some special exceptions as you'll as you're going to find out. But first, um, like I said, there's going to be the best and like you know a couple of the worst as well. But first, I want to start off with the honor roll the stuff that was really good, but just didn't quite um, make the cut. So, starting off, I just want to give, give a good shout out to um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which you know I bought, like I bought the um, like a, a huge chunk of the IDW run, like um, from Comicsology. It's like as a bundle, and you know I just want to say this is the year that I went digital, and there was a lot, found lots of great stuff there, and this is probably like the um, like the banner, like like the uh, standard bearer for that stuff, because like I loved. Well, no, no, I didn't say love. I, I really, I genuinely, and genuinely enjoyed a lot of the uh, stuff from the new Ninja Turtles series, but it didn't quite really get, get me until we got to the uh, second half, second part of the Vengeance arc in, in Volume Thirteen, where, where um the, where the turtles um fi- turtles and Splinter finally decide to settle things with Shredder, and it ends up with um Splinter um defeating Shredder and assuming control of the Foot Clan, which was like whoa. It's like mind blown. It's like great um, plot twist, and the follow up has been pretty decent so far. But you know, it's like that was been like the um, the one truly great moment. It's like in in the series, one that, that you know I was perfectly content to keep reading things, but this is the one point in the series where it made me go, "Wow, I want to know what happens next." And that's probably gonna be like a, something we're gonna come back to in my list. But then we also had um, Dark Horse's Great White Hope for manga, um, "I Am a Hero," which the first volume. Like really entertaining about this um, Japanese manga creator who, like who who is um, a mentally unstable and b owns a um, shotgun rifle, and c um, winds up I'm um, having to deal with a zombie um, outbreak in like in his um, like in his hometown. The first volume did a great job of of um, keeping things um, unclear as whether or not he was you know crazy or if there was an or if um, there was actual like. Um, like zombie activity going on, and um, that was that was good. Second volume, like did a good, had some really good scenes in in there, but there was also a lot where it was just um, it just felt like it was marking time with his observing his mental instability, and um, it didn't things didn't really start picking up again until until the end. So there you go. Um, then there was the fade out, which marked a um, nice return to form for um, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips after the. You know, not bad, but not great effort of Fatal, and um, the Fatal was a good um, 1940s, um, not sorry, 1950s era um, noir um, murder mystery that ha- about a uh, Hollywood screenwriter with writer's block who has to um, sol- who tries to solve the mystery of the uh, starlet who dies in the film that he was that he was writing, and all the uh, crazy ass stuff that happens as he tries to unravel it. It's like, like I said, it wasn't like I said it um, maybe not. As good as their best stuff, but definitely, um, like, definitely a nice shows you that um, after Fatal had them just doing so that was okay. Like, it was nice to see them back on their, like, um, doing stuff that was like you know consistently good. Then there's um, New Avengers and Ultimates, which shows that um, Al Ewing is kind of like the um, heir apparent to uh, Jonathan Hickman in terms of Avengers stories at Marvel. It's like it's kind of too early to see where like how. 
like whether or not this is all going to turn out as good as um, Hickman's stuff did, but um, so far with um, with what he's doing, with he, what he's doing on those two these two series show is um, probably some of the most um, entertaining um, superhero comics um, at Marvel um, going right now. Then there's um, Tetris, um, the games people play by, by Box Brown. Here's here's a guy telling the story of um, both the creation of Tetris by um, Alexei Pachetnov behind the Iron Curtain like in, in Soviet era Russia during the 80s, and how um, it's like and how Nintendo managed to snag the rights for it for both its both the NES and Game Boy, and the uh, just the, the general legal wrangling bit that um, that that allowed that to happen. It's like it's um, while it takes a while to, to get going. It's a, a must-read for anyone who who um, has played Tetris and wants to know the story of the game, as well as anyone like me who had who had heard that basically um, Pajitnov had basically been screwed out of his, um, you know, his uh, like his proper um, like reward for creating this um, groundbreaking game, and it turns out that hey, you know, it's like th- that this game that the story actually does have kind of a happy happy ending, and it's like in the end, which I which I loved. And also, um, Knights of Sidonia, um, Tomo Nihei's, um, like a mecha, it's like mecha series that showed him, um, dialing back his, um, style to um, something more conventional, but not, um, thoroughly un- unsatisfying. This is actually a not, a really good example of, of a creator with a very esoteric style, um, trying to, um, decide that, hey, you know, he wants, um, you know, a kind of mainstream success and he wants, uh, and while he simplifies his style to make it more accessible, it's like he also doesn't discount any of the um, weirdness that um, made it appealing in the first place. So, like I said, conventional but thoroughly satisfying with lots of um, parts that are just like that um, you just wouldn't find in um, like you know, mainstream manga anyway. But and also um, now before I get into the um, top ten list in general, I want to give a special shout out to um, Wraith by um, Joe Hill. And I'm Charles Paul Wilson the Third. This file you can follow this under best thing I read in 2016 that didn't come out in this year. It's a uh, it's an eight issue miniseries where it's like where Hill um like goes into like um, like goes into the backstory and tells us another st- story about the um, one of the characters from his novels um Nosferatu. It's like um char- like um story of Charlie Manx. It's like and on um, his. It's like and the car that he uses to bring kids to the uh, eternal um like like a wonderland of Christmas of Christmas land. And while the um middle six issues of this of the uh, miniseries are the story of um a couple of convicts who wind up um, finding their way into this place, it's like and um the horrors that it has, the um bookend issues tell the story of um Manx and the con artist who um like who wound up uh, making Manx into the uh, monster that he um, became in the series? It's like are are truly fantastic. It's great stuff. And if I had you know had the common sense to actually buy this when it came out in 2014, it probably would have made the list then. But you know that's all the buildup. And so as for the uh, best of 2016, the top 10 starts with two titles sharing the spot. Top 10: Assassination Classroom and One Punch Man. Now these are both um, two very different series. One is about a, uh, a an alien tentacle teacher who is turning, who's training his his um school of his class of level level losers in the art of assassination in order to defeat him before he um before he um makes before he blows up the earth at the end of the year. Now, the other one is probably one of the best superhero comics running about a uh, about a super about a hero who can defeat anything with one punch. Why are they? It's like, why are they on sharing a list? Well, because they're both shown in jump titles, and they kind of like uh, mark my uh, year. Because you know, hey, when, whenever one month, like in one month, they they come up bi monthly. So one month it was assassination, assassination classroom. The other one it was One Punch Man. So it's like, it's like so throughout the year, I was um, fed a cons- a um, thoroughly consistent um, diet of quality shown in jump titles. Basically, two titles that show that hey, you know. Like even if Jump is a is a series that is aimed at kids, the very best stuff of which um, Assassination Classroom and One Punch Man um, qualify, like is appeal, can appeal to kids of all ages. This is why you're not seeing Attack on Titan um, on my list or, um, oh jeez, uh, um, Tokyo Ghoul because while those series are 
are basically titles that you know mainly appeal to uh, like you know teenagers who haven't been um, like like. I don't know. It's like I haven't had their senses dull by years of um, familiar genre stories, like you know, like I have. Well, um, in terms of what, Assassination Classroom and One Punch Man, you know, tran- the transcend age. It's like and our like funds for kids of all ages. There you go. Now number nine, it's like is um Secret Wars by Jonathan Hickman and Asad Rabik. Now, the flaws with um the Secret Wars are are really apparent once you. Once you read it, it's like there is, um, ah, uh, great. It's like let me let me back back up a second. Oh, so the, the flaws are it's like okay, you've got it's like there are a lot. There are several plot points that aren't addressed. Like um, what the hell was Maximus doing um as the uh, it's like as the Mad Prophet? What um like how did um T'Challa and Namor finally um, make up again? After they're like trying to be at each, at each other's throats at the end of um, time runs out, what and um just what the hell was going on with Cyclops and um and the Phoenix egg he had going there, so but you know even with these um plots that that um didn't that weren't um satisfactorily addressed, Secret Wars is a grand um epic conclusion to Hickman's run, and one that also features some of the most um indelible moments of the. Uh, like of the year so far, but like particularly with um, with with the final confrontation with uh, between um, Doom and um and Reed Richards. It's like I look at this, I look at that moment, and wow, that that just kind of something I I something I keep coming back to, and something that you know just makes it's that has like a, the kind of comic book cleverness that I love to read or in my superhero com- comics. It's like and um, there's plenty of good stuff beyond that, but um. Flawed though it is, Secret Wars was still a worthy inclusion to years of um, Hickman's storytelling on on Avengers. So, also, I'm uh, moving up to number eight. We've got um, Warren Ellis's um, long-awaited return to this list with um, Volume Two of Injection, which featured the story of it's like of um it's like of detect of um of lo- detect- detective slash logicist Vivek Headland and the um ghost it's like and the uh, ghost sandwich sexer. So. It's basically um uh, Ellis's take on the uh, on the Sherlock Holmes Holmes genre with um Headland being a um, uniquely um un, it's like like un, unsympathetic it's like and and direct it's like and direct and uncompromising hero, but he's also but it's also kind of a rebuttal to the idea that you know that like um hero that these kind of heroes need to uh, like th- um divest themselves of all emotion. Especially in one of the a, mem- a thoroughly memorable sequence when um, when Headland's um, it's like um, he- um, he- um, um, bodyguard slash henchman um, leaves, saying he's going out going out for a night with his girlfriend, something that Headland would know nothing about. And then we get a nice a, a great two page spread of Headland showing his various and um, ver- various and varied um, sexual conquests that also include um, like some interactions with the uh, existing um, injection cast. Um, I was very disappointed to learn that um, volume three was going to be delayed because of um, Ellis's health problems was, as well as artist Declan Shalvey's um, commitments to backup stories in, in um, all-star Batman. But um, volume two, it's like, is basically, is basically the best thing that I've read from Warren Ellis in, it's like in years and, and basically shows you if you wonder why why I I refer to myself as an Ellis completist, it's because he keeps he can offer up stuff like this. So moving up, it's like number seven is Claus. Um, Claus as in Santa Claus. This is Grant Morrison and Dan Mora's um, re- reimagining of Santa Claus. It's like getting well, not really reimagining in the sense in the sense that he's they're they're talking about they want to get back to his um, Germanic Germanic and Slavic roots. It's like, but also, I'm um, p- pitching the character as a as a superhero, but someone who will like fight against um, the injustice, like the injustice of the town that um, has outlawed that has outlawed fun and gift giving. It's like, and uh, um, one who is um, also um, secretly um, like bent on worshiping the evil um, Krampus, which leads to a um, great um, Santa Claus versus Krampus fight at the end of the volume, which we've got um, Claus going. There are no bad children, and. Yeah, that's just like a great, um, like joyous moment that you know, that even if um, 
like some of the um a lot of the dialogue in here could be described as say expository it's like like morrison's um imagination and joy and Mora's um brilliantly detailed art like really make this into a um thoroughly fun series that you know it's that is definitely worth reread will definitely be worth rereading at every christmas to come now also speaking of superheroes i have I have to give respect to um, my number six choice, Superman, American Alien. Now, why do we need another um, retelling of Superman's origin? Well, when you're um, Max Landis and you're like going into um, Superman's like um, like his or his um, early days as but as a kid who is um, learning that hey, I I I can fly and like how do I sure I can go up, but how do I come down? Or you know what do I do when I've when I'm faced with injustice and I've got all this power that can, um, it's like they can, you know, maybe make it right, but I may wind up uh, killing a bunch of people or, you know, Hey, when, um, I wind up, you know, it's like being mistaken with Bruce Wayne on his yacht. Like, what do I do? Well, I'm going to party, man. It's like, there's, it's, it's a series that, you know, ask that, that takes like a night, a, a fun skewed look at the, it's like at the character. It's like, and, um, and that comes with lots of interesting reasons as, you know, this is why he does what he does. And it also has, um, a great, um, take on Lex Luthor as someone who thoroughly believes that he is, you know, the, um, someone who is one of the great, um, people of history and that, you know, Hey, it's like, I, it's like, you know, it's like, I will change the course of history, not you. So you can just, um, go, it's like, go, go play with the kitties and all. So it's, and, and, in the end, it also has a great um, Superman versus Lobo fight as a nice um, catharsis at the, at the end. So I hear I hear rumors that um, there there are going to be that um, Landis may have more um, Superman stories in in the tank. And after this, it's like I definitely love to see them. All right, moving up to the top five, we got Volume Three of Phonogram by Kieran Guylan and Jimmy McKelvey. I love this series, and if there is any justice in the world. We this would be a night. This would be heading towards a sixty-issue run. While um, it's like well, they're it's like well, um, um, Guylin and um, McKelvey um are prepping their prepping um the Wicked and the Divine for to debut after their this um series would become their signature one. But that doesn't happen. This series is about um magic as music, about music as magic, um and the uh, story of it's like of one of um one. It's like a, a woman I'm um, selling half of her personality and then having that person I like, come back to bite her. It's like, is it's like, is a very um, worthy finale to the series. It's like, um, I rebought this, um, on, it's like, uh, like on comiXology after they're selling individual issues for 99 cents each. And it was absolutely worth it for the additional commentary supplied by Gallen, the extra, um, music glossary, um, pages and the, um, B sides, like included as well. You'll be able to get all of the B-sides um, for all three um, phonogram series like in the complete phonogram hardcover, which will be out um, quite soon from what I, from what I hear. But um, phonogram volume three is a, like I said, it's a fantastic end of the series that should have gone on for much, much longer than um, these ancient issues. But I guess in the end, we're just lucky to get, to get these as they are. Now, I'm not done with Guylin because, hey, as I told you last time, you can expect to hear me talk talk about um, Darth Vader again, which um, takes my number four slot. Now, it's like I now this is this like I said I not not sure how much I want to reiterate what I said last time, but basically this is a great um, twenty five issue run that shows you there's a nice complete story about how Darth Vader went from from disgrace at the end of Episode four to I'm um, running the show again. It's like in Episode five, so. It's like, and, um, there's, but, um, and aside from just, you know, showing the, um, Darth, D- the, um, baddest Dark Lord of the Sith doing, um, the, the uh, most, vi- most evil and villainous things he can, he also shows you, it's like, he's, you know, there's also a certain amount of humanity in, in him as well, that he does his best to snuff out a lot. It's like along the way. It's like, it's like, it's great. It's great dark fun. And the only, um, Star Wars series from Marvel and is that has actually equaled the best of what Dark Horse put out like um, during the years that they had the license as well. Now, moving, moving up again, we've got um, Monthly Girls Nozaki Kun, which um, it's like this is a series by um, that I picked up because it was being offered by for three bucks like on my Kindle, and um, 
So I figured, oh, well, why not? I might as well see what it's like, because I, I heard good things about the anime, and it was a it was a glorious comic series about, about this girl who, fa- who falls in love with this um, mo- who, um, who, who is um, in love with this, um, this guy in her class, but um, finds out, but um, can't quite, but phrases her love in such a way that he thinks that she, that she wants to become his um, assistant in creating manga. And the uh, humor that, that erupts in their relationship, as well as the other characters that um, it's like the series revolves around, has been like has, has been truly sterling. It's been a, this is probably one of the series I that I most look forward to, like as it comes out on. It's like like every every three months. Like I keep like I keep religious tabs on saying, okay, well it's been three months. Is this gonna, is new volume out yet? It's like it's like as soon as I as soon as I read this first volume, it's like um I was I was in love with this series the series just because of this humor, it's humor and character, and um I'm absolutely looking forward to. To more, to more of it as it comes out. In fact, you know, even though I'm like hooked, hooked on buying it digitally, I kind of wish I'd bought it in physical format because um, Yen Press keeps releasing the uh, the uh, physical volumes ahead of the digital ones. So that that's my tragedy right there. Anyway, moving up to um, the penultimate title on this list, there's um, Hellboy in Hell, volume <laughs> volume two specifically, the Death Card. Now. The reason I put this here is because, well, I was kind of upset about the fact that um, that Mignola was calling it quits after um, ten issues. When he, I had originally heard this is going to be like an ongoing series of about like say twenty twenty issues or so. So when um, Mignola says, "Oh, you know, I'm wrapping it up after 10, um, and these are ten issues that had been very irregularly serialized, like over the past couple of years, I was. I looked at this and thought, well, shit, you know what I mean? Like, you, what, you just couldn't hack, um, like do like an on, like, like, a, like any kind of schedule. And you're just, so you're just, you're just done, man. It's like, you're just going to like call it quits. Cause you couldn't like tell the story you wanted to. Well, then I actually read the uh, book and wow, that, that is that it actually wound up being a very satisfying run. Um, like end to, um, to Hellboy story. I mean, yeah, there's going to be more, you know, stories of his time with the B- BPRD going forward until I guess it's, you know, not commercially sellable. But as far as like the end of Hellboy's story, it's like this, this was a good, this is a, this is a very, um, worthy end that had, that had lots of humor, quirk. It's like, and horror in the end. And, you know, it's actually not a complete downer that, that you expect when like the character winding up in hell and um, when he decides to um, acquiesce to his destiny, well, you know, it turns out that's that you know, becoming the uh, like the de- the uh, demon of the apocalypse, the beast of the apocalypse. Well, it turns out like there's there's certain ways that can be interpreted. So yeah, um, bravo to um, Mike Pignola for finding a a good way to uh, to, to not only um, subvert my expectations but also um, prove me wrong. It's like, as far as I can, you know, what I came, came to expect. But as far as the uh, the best thing I read this year, that would be something that offered that um, genuinely surprised me. Something that took that also took something that I was you know not expecting to enjoy, and then made it um, fascinating. And then at at the very end of it, turned it on its head and made me go, "Wow!" It's like I did not see that coming. I absolutely have to know where is this going next. And that would be the most recent volume of The Walking Dead, volume 26, A Call to Arms. With um, basically, yeah, it's basically the Negan show in the sense that, you know, he gets loose and you think that, oh, he's going to team up with the Whispers and it's going to be like, you know, great. It's going to be the supervillain team up as Rick and the people of Alexandria have to fight off um, their fight off like, you know, these the, like the two most villainous forces in the series so far. But no, in, in fact, like a lot of uh, the fun from this series, from this volume, basically has um, basically has um, Kirk, Robert, writer Robert Kirkman showing um how Negan's um antisocial nature winds up just completely trolling the uh, like the Whisperers and their actions, and um, it's like and eventually when he finally gets them to learn to um lower their guard and he sticks the knife in, 
and you think, okay, well, he's this is why he, obviously he's doing it because he wants to take over, and um, he's because he's the big bad guy, right? No, because he's got he because this volume reveals that Negan is utterly sincere about one thing, and it was the it was one thing that um, I could that that you won't find out about until the very last page, and even when you do find out about it, you'll find that it makes perfect sense as far as you know why. It's like why he did what he did. It's, you know, for a series that has been going on as long as The Walking Dead has to pull like this, this kind of crazy ass twist um, was frankly like nothing short of remarkable. And, you know, even though I've, I, I've talked about how good this series is, it's like this, this kind of like really reaffirmed, you know, yeah, it really is the best ongoing series running. You know, maybe I'll feel differently once um, the Whisperer War um, collection comes out uh, comes out in March, but um, like as far as 20, 2016 goes, you know the Walking um, this this latest one, the Walking Dead, was the one to beat. Or if you wanted to go one more and you want me to talk about my zeroth title, the this is the title that is on the um, brink between a genius and um, complete and utter shit. Um, I would have to give a nod to. Prison School by Akira Hiramoto. This is a series about four knuckleheads who wind up who are enroll in an all in a formerly all girls school and and um and I wind up getting um like thrown into a prison after they were um kind of rightly accused of peeping on the girls while they're, while they're bathing. But this is a series that has been you know gloriously brilliantly dumb. It's like ever since the start, and um, this most recent volume, volume five, um, brings an end to the initial arc, showing you like you know why the how the guys finally managed to um, escape, uh, get out of being in prison, and also the uh, the trauma that erupts when um, one of them just you know can't deal with that, and he tries to find a way to get back in prison, and it's a kind of it's it's a it's a method that involves. Um, like a uh, male rope bondage, um, a boob Goldberg, and a guy um, trying to find the best way to uh, slide across the halls um, while being waxed. Um, it's it's like it's um it's glory it's it's dumb it's terrible it's like but it's but it's written with a uh, with a with a passion and and that and a, and a level of seriousness that basically that basically goes that it wouldn't be as fun if it didn't take itself seriously. It's like, it's like I said, it, it's the guy here. Most knows how dumb, um, what he, what he's writing is, but he, um, attacks it with a level of seriousness that, um, makes it, that makes it that much, that much funnier as a result. So, and, um, well, the end of, um, volume five suggests does just is kind of turning into more emotional, and I'm um, somewhat redundant on ter- territory. I'm worried that, you know, this may be the last um, time I'll be able to refer to prison school as being gloriously, um, entertainingly dumb, but as it is like, it straddles the line perfectly between being brilliant and terrible. So yeah, it's brilliantly terrible. So there you go. But to wrap things up, you know, as far as, um, actual terrible things go, well, there's two series I want to point out for that specifically. There is um, Deadpool, World's Greatest, Volume 1, Millionaire with a Mouth, where um, writer Jerry Dugan um, takes over the Merc with the Mouth's uh, adventures and promptly shows that um, co-writer and comedian Brian Posehn was really the guy responsible for all the funny stuff in the series. I've been... It, really, seriously, this is a series that... Um, that um, this is the volume that basically uh, asks us to find um, the pronunciation of George Stephanopoulos. Stephanopoulos's name, um, funny, and no, it it just doesn't work. And um, it's also a lot more emo as Deadpool um, encounters a a, a new um, nemesis, a mad, it's like a madcap guy who was living in his brain for a while and is um, kind of bitter about it. It was um, it's like it wasn't funny. It was um. It's like it was needlessly dramatic. It's like, and you know, I kind of want to give it a second chance because of what's because of the good stuff that um, Dugan did with Wazane, like for the um, 
you know, initial half of this run, but yeah, I just can't, I just think of this volume and I just go, you know, I really, I just think, you know, I just can't take that risk. Yeah, there you go. But also probably even more disappointing is volume two of Scarlet by Brian Michael Bendis and Alex Maleve, which I put the first volume on one of my, on my 10 best list for, what is it? 2012. It's, it's been years, years. I tell you, and um, while the series should have been an electrifying read because of how current it was and showing you how police violence um, against armed civilians has been a, a hot-button topic this year, it, just the simple fact that um, Bendis and Leave um, couldn't get their act together to actually deliver these issues on a regular basis, it's like, and in the end, delivered a story that basically um, said, hey, you know, it's like, we're... Like if they ended on a cliffhanger and be saying, Hey, if you want to know what happens next, well, we've got more issues coming in 2017, which yeah, huh, no fucking way guys. Like you guys completely fucked up the, the, the delivery of the issues in this volume. Like, so it's like, you know, why should I even believe you're gonna be capable of delivering them on a, like on a consistent basis for 2017. In fact, the, probably the only reason you delivered these issues is because it was picked up as a series by um, Showtime. So, hey, if you want to know what happens to Scarlet, don't bo- don't read the comic. You're probably better off just waiting for Showtime to debut the TV series, either either um, this year or next. So, there you go. My best and worst of 2016. 2017. Well, I hope. It's like, I hope there's um, even better stuff to look forward to, but I've probably already gone on way too long. It's like at this point, but Hey, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, like the uh, DC rebirth stuff that should be hitting trade paperbacks like anytime soon, as well as the, um, the rele- the American release of um, Joko Rui's um, dungeon meshy delicious in dungeon, which um, I've been reading in scanlated form. And um, it's all about, you know, finding delicious things to eat while doing a dungeon crawl. So it's gloriously fun stuff, and I can't wait to read it to actually pay money to um, give to make sure that um, she gets the money she she deserves for have, after I've read this series in scanlated form. So there you go. That's only a couple of things to look forward to, but there's probably going to be lots more as the year goes on. Um, John, it's like any thoughts on your end about all this? Well, I um, cool. First of all, um, there were some good things in 2016. Um, however, uh, I'm actually eager to see what comic book movies are going to be coming out. And I know that this is kind of a, a skewed, slightly side topic from the pureness of a, a comic book podcast, but, um, you know, there's no, I'll allow it. Yeah, of course. You can, like, I'll allow this. Okay. So I am looking forward to, you know, we did have some really good movies, uh, you know, in 2016, but I'm looking forward to seeing what 2017 has in store for us. Um, you know, with respect to things like, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and whatnot. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and Thor, um, um, Ragnarok are probably two of the safest bets um, coming forward, given Marvel's track record. Um, Wonder Woman, well, it had better be um, really damn good, considering um, DC's track record up to this point. I agree. Uh, you know, it's... Uh... Whew, if it doesn't do well, um, that's going to be a tough, uh, a hard, a hard sell, you know. Um, as for you know this, uh, uh, how do you want to call it the the DC cinematic universe? I don't know what they're calling it exactly. Just yeah, that that's clo- that's that's a good as way of saying it as anything. Yeah, you know, after all, you know, Marvel slash Disney has had. Uh, they've had a lot of good successes um, in building their universe, and uh, and they continue to uh, churn out those um, those movies based on the you know based on the comic books, um, and uh, you know. But uh, yeah, they I think they have a steeper hill to climb, and I know that there are a lot of DC fans out there who probably say, "Well, we like it just fine." Yeah, unfortunately. Um, you know, <laughs> the ones who are saying we do like it just fine are probably the ones who were who like DC regardless of what they do. Right, exactly. So you know, it, you know, it, they're not blockbusters, and they certainly have not been able to repeat the successes of the you know the Dark Knight trilogy at all. 
um, no. at, you know, in terms of overall appeal, um, you know, so, which is, like I said, something that uh, the Marvel Disney, uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe has done an outstanding job of, you know, an outstanding job of, so um, uh, to see them continue this track, you know, yeah, it, you know, and then basically, we, basically at this point, we trust Marvel. DC, it's like you know, we're still waiting to be uh, delivered upon. Yeah, and you know what? And they, and this might be their year. Who knows? You know, I don't I know. I hope it's their year. I, I, you know, I, here, here's the thing, and I, and I've mentioned this before. I just want them to produce a great movie. You know, produce a really good movie. You know, and some, like I said, some people will say, well, they already have, and I'm like, well, you know, bring back the glory. You know, like. Like what we saw with the Dark Knight trilogy, just bring something back that absolutely just rivets us into the storyline. You know, unfortunately, the direction of everything that's got, been going so far, it hasn't proven to be the same. You know, kind of success. So, well, we'll, we'll see. There's always a you know a diamond in the rough kind of a thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, but uh, yeah, so it should be an interesting year for that as well. You know. Um, and you never know what other things just might be lying in the weeds and come straight out, you know, and, and just be the surprise out of left like, field like hit. Was this year. Yeah, absolutely. Right. No one could predict that. That, that was, you know, fantastic, you know. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> yes, even better than the X-Men movie in some ways. Come on. It's, uh, <laughs> which, are still, which are still entertaining, but, you know, it's like kind of like if you depending on how depending on your tolerance for cheese exactly exactly so but uh like i said the, this should be a this should be a good year for that um you know like i said i'm um guardians of the galaxy well, and, volume we two. Hope, and we hope logan is a very good send-off for, oh. for jackman's wolverine too oh yeah if, it, if, <laughs> if it's hopefully it can it'll at least be half as good as its trailer uh, yeah, right. You know, it does look, uh, really promising and, uh, and not to mention the, you know, a little Patrick Stewart throwing a little bit of seasoning there. Right. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this, this should be, I, I'm, uh, we've just, you've discussed this before, but yeah, definitely want to see how they, uh, interpret this material for the, for the big screen. So, um, well, outside of that, um, uh, do you know what you're going to talk about next time? Are you going to do a 10 worst or what? <laughs> uh, no, it's like that's thankfully I don't read enough for, I read lots, but you know, I don't have enough for a 10 worst. No, this next, next, next week is going to be, a, next time is going to be about, um, a guy who had a really great 2016, um, Tom King. But you know, if you notice that I didn't mention any of his titles on my, uh, 10 best or even my worst of list. Well, hmm. That might give you an idea of what I think about him so far. But my thoughts on like his, on the stuff he gave us in 2016, well, that's next time. All right, and we'll catch you next time on Comic Picks by the Glick. All right, laters. Bye.